Let's talk about the shipping process right now for you as it's been changed over the last week. What have you had to change? Well, so we've been fortunate we did not have any ships in the immediate area. We, we have from time to time because obviously Baltimore is a, is a large coal port, particularly on the east coast of the United States. Um, so what we've done, though, is we have continued shipping globally. Um, as you said, we move iron ore, we move coal, we move grains, as well as a whole host of other commodities such as salt, sugar, gypsum, steel products, wood products. It really runs the gamut in terms of dry bulk shipping commodities. What do you think the economic impact across your industry would be? Just before you came on, we kind of showed a stock screen about mm. you and your competitors, how different companies have been impacted. What do you think the ultimate impact will be? I think it's going to be relatively small. I think what you have to do is put into perspective, there's about 25 million tons of coal split between thermal and metallurgical coal, which goes into the steel industry. Most of that goes to Asia, India in particular. But when you compare the 25 million tons to the 450 million tons that China imported last year, the over 200 million tons that India imported last year, it's not that large. And so our expectation, and again, I think it's very tough to tell right now, but hopefully in the next few weeks, there will be deeper channels that are established in Baltimore. I, unfortunately, I, um, I, I believe it's more of a local economic issue um, than it is necessarily necessarily for, for global shipping at this point and, and as we know. Well, this is what I was going to go with you to next is how do you see the road to recovery here? I I, I think it's very difficult to tell right now. I mean, the, this morning I watched the, the NTSB video that uh, of, of the guys on board that were doing the assessment, and you obviously can still see massive amounts of, of debris on the ship and in the background. So it, it's a little difficult to tell how long that will take to clear. They, they, from what I understand, they've established two channels, but they're, they're fairly... Um, they're really for more tug and barge. They don't have a lot of draft. Um, they're sort of 11 to maybe 13 feet of draft, whereas you know our ships are anywhere from 30 to 40 feet of draft. So I, I still think it's a little while before an actual commercial channel can be opened up, unfortunately. There's the channel itself, and then there's the fallout from what had happened in the first place as well. How do you think about the responsibility to the industry after what had happened? Look, it's, um, it's a very difficult situation. Um, we obviously don't know what caused uh, the ship to, uh, to have issues. Um, I think there, you know, I would certainly focus on possible fuel issues and contamination, possibly an electrical issue that occurred on board. But again, very, very, it's just too early to, to tell. And there's obviously a long investigation that, uh, that, has to, uh, that has to go on. Now, we were talking about the industry implications. We were talking about the implications to Baltimore as well. Mm. What about to the commodity markets? We were talking about some critical commodities, iron ore, coal, uh, grain, what is most impacted with a lot of these diversions? I, I, so it, it's, it's, re, it's really interesting, right, that shipping is, is in the news so much because we started out with the Panama Canal, right, and, and the issues of uh, curtailing the number of ships that were going through the Panama Canal, which, care, which has a lot of grain on the dry bulk side that would normally go through there. Um, but because of the lower water levels, that canal can only really push through 27 ships a day versus normally 40 or 41. Then we had the issue that's, that's taken place in the southern Red Sea area and the, uh, the unfortunate attacks on, on maritime assets. And so what you, you take the Panama Canal, you take the Red Sea. I mean, that is adding 20 days just to U.S. grain shipments to, uh, to go around uh, South Africa and, and out to Asia. And now we have this unfortunate disaster that, that has occurred in Baltimore. As I said, from a dry bulk standpoint, it's about 25 million tons. I think a year. I think a lot, some of that can be diverted and taken from Hampton Roads, you know, railed down and then put on ships. Um, and then I also think once the channel is open again, there'll be a catch up um, as well, most likely on coal shipments. It's also a very large car carrier port. Um, from what I understand, most of that is being diverted to other ports uh, in the U.S., including New York, Newark. 
Um, and then obviously a container port as well. But I think most of that can be diverted to, to other ports at this point. When you think about a lot of these supply chain disruptions and diversions here, is that short for saying that among the most heavily impacted commodities would be grain? Because that also implies food prices facing a bigger yes. hit moving forward. Yes, grain. Grain has been heavily impacted by the Panama Canal. Uh, putting putting down the number number of ships that can go through there, and then also the the Red Sea. As I said, it was almost a double whammy that that took place in a very brief period of time. And most ships now, and and we certainly are, and have been since really end of December. We've been diverting our ships around the Red Sea area and and going around South Africa to to head out to Asia. You have the Red Sea, the Panama Canal, and the Baltimore port. If you think about all of these incidents, are they isolated and one off? or are they interconnected in some way? How, as a CEO of a company, do you plan for all of this? It is difficult. Um, we obviously, in, in any time in shipping, you have to be able to adjust quickly. Um, and certainly, I think, um, having gone through the operational issues during COVID in 2020, we're more prepared than we ever have been um, in dealing with these short-term issues. I think the Panama Canal, the Panama Canal is more of a drought issue and lack of rainfall. There is some hope that as we get into to May and June that rainfall will pick up in Panama and the water levels will come back up and more ships will be allowed to go through. The Red Sea is, I think, a longer term issue. I think it's a very difficult decision for a ship owner to make at this point to put their crew in peril by going through the Suez Canal and then all the way down um, through the southern Red Sea at this point. It's just, it's just not safe, and so which is why we're, we're going around the uh, South Africa. I'm going to ask you to put on your macroeconomic hat for just a moment here. Sure. And if you had to kind of predict the direction of travel here, between fuel and commodities, as we've been talking about. Do things get a lot worse from here? In terms of prices, going in, term of, in terms of prices, so what's interesting is um, we have been shipping a lot, and not just a lot of iron ore and coal, but from an unseasonable standpoint. Usually, the first quarter is the softest time in the year, and what we what we've actually seen are higher freight rates. So if you if you look at our, the guidance that we put out for first quarter a couple weeks ago, we actually showed higher freight rates in the first quarter that we booked uh, than the fourth quarter. Highly unusual usually because of rainy weather in Brazil. There's not as much iron ore shipped. This year with El Nino, it's been very dry. The price of iron ore hovered around 140, 150 for a long period of time. Inventory levels in China for iron ore needed to be restocked. So you had a perfect storm and freight rates really outperformed in the, in the first quarter. John, we really thank you for a look inside the industry there. That is John Wobensmith of Genco Shipping.